And as you've heard, we, uh, the, the topic is wisdom and power uh, for our weekend conference. And uh, basically, I'm just going through 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So we, uh, we looked at the beginning of the chapter, where uh, the first verses where Paul introduces himself. And then in verse 2, he tells us who he's writing to. And um, to me, verse 2 is a wonderful verse because he, he refers to them as the church of God. And he says they are sanctified in Christ Jesus. And he says they're called to be saints. And uh, if, if you know anything about the Corinthians, which I'm sure you all do, they were a very messed up church. And yet, yet he says these things that he says about them in verse 2. So I think if they, if they can be the church of God and they, can be, and they are sanctified and they are saints, there's hope for me too then. And uh, so I love that verse. And um, then as we move along, Paul has many, many issues that he needs to address with this church because, again, there are so many problems. Um, and in verse 10, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. And so he begins here addressing the first of many issues, and that is that there are contentions in the church in Corinth. And in verse 12, we see that they're, they've divided themselves into four groups. Uh, one says, I am of Paul, another I of Apollos, another I of Cephas, and a fourth one says, I of Christ. Then in verse 13, Paul asks them three challenging questions. And then he's going, and, and the answer to all these questions is no. But he's going to go into more detail on each of these issues because they're, they're ignorant about a number of things and they need, need to be instructed. And he covers this information in, re, in the reverse order of the questions in verse 13. So the last question in verse 13 is, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? And of course, the answer to that question is no, but they need to know more than just that the answer is no. And so beginning in verse 14, he is going to give them some more information about that issue of were you baptized in the name of Paul? Um, and so verse 14, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. Um, and so forth. We talked about that last night. Um, and then in verse 17, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And again, we talked about those things last night. But if you look back at verse 13 then, the, the second question, the middle question is, was Paul crucified for you? And so after he covers the information about were you baptized in the name of Paul, now he's going to cover some information about the, the second question, was Paul crucified for you? And uh, so he kind of begins that at the end of verse 17, where he says, um, not with the wisdom of words, but the cross of, uh, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And then as we go along in the passage now, we'll see that he's going to talk about the, the cross. And of course, it was not Paul that was crucified for them. Um, the, the phrase, the wisdom of words in verse 17, it's important to recognize that we, usually when we think of wisdom or use the word wisdom, it's a positive thing. You know, it's good for us to be wise, good for us to have wisdom. But the, that phrase in verse 17, the wisdom of words, that's a negative thing. It makes the cross of Christ of none effect. So in the Bible, wisdom is not always a good thing. For example, James says that there's a wisdom from above, but then he says there's a wisdom that is not from above, but it's a devilish wisdom. And so this wisdom of words here is not a good thing. It makes the cross of Christ of none effect. Now, what is this wisdom of words? Well, I think... To understand that phrase, wisdom of words, you have to go both backwards and forwards. And what I mean by that, if you, if you look at that wisdom of words in verse 17, what, what is that about? 
Well, if you go backwards in the context, he's talking about baptism. In verse 17, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So water baptism in this dispensation of grace is not a part of water baptism. In fact, it's in contrast or opposition. Uh, so you, it's Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. They're in opposition to one another in this dispensation. And so preaching a gospel that includes water baptism in this dispensation would be an example of wisdom of words that makes the, the cross of Christ of none effect. Um, turn with me for a moment to Matthew chapter 15. Again, Paul uh, talks about the wisdom of words which make the cross of Christ of none effect. And uh, there's a similar, uh, a similar phrase that found in Matthew chapter 15. Um, if we start in, let's start in verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, it's interesting to me that uh, in 1 Corinthians 1, where he talks about the wisdom of words makes the cross of Christ of none effect, as I pointed out, the context there is water baptism. Here in Matthew 15, he's also going to talk about something that makes the word of God of none effect. And notice in verse 2, it's again in the context of water baptism. Now, in this case, they're not water baptizing people. They're water baptizing their, their hands. Um, and if we would compare what, uh, I believe it's Mark says about the same issue, he talks about how they also baptized pots and pans and so on and so forth. They, they washed all of those things. Verse 3, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So here the issue is tradition, religious tradition. And then he, uh, he gives an example in verse 4 five, and 5, um, which we won't go into. And then verse 6, And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So in 1 Corinthians 1, the cross of Christ is made of none effect. Here in Matthew 15, 6, the commandment of God is made of none effect. Um, and in both cases, again, it's interesting to me, that there's, there's a, a water ceremony, water baptism in the context. Okay, turn back then to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And so if we go backwards in the context again, um, it seems clear to me that the water baptism in this dispensation is a, would be an example of the wisdom of words. Um, but then to understand better the wisdom of words, we have to go forward in the context. So let's do that. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Uh, verse 18 uh, tells us what the gospel is today. And there's there's uh, thousands of different gospels out there being preached even this morning. But what is the true gospel that we are to preach? And verse 18 says, the preaching of the cross. That's what we preach today. That's our gospel. It's not repent and be baptized or you know, all the other gospels that are out there. But it's the preaching of the cross. Um, the, the word, again in verse 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. That, the word uh, that is translated power here, the Greek word is the word from which we get the word dynamite. So there, there's, there's dynamite, there's power. And notice that the power here is not, is not something uh, experiential. That it's not something you feel, not some experience that happens to you. Um, it's not the Holy Ghost doing some kind of strange thing to you, making you 
you know, run up and down the aisles. Or the, the first, time, first time I ever went to a Pentecostal church, I was in Minneapolis. And I was, the whole time I was like, <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> uh, like I, I felt like I was in a circus or something, and I, I just couldn't take it all in. Because uh, the pastor in that church was, he had to be close to 300 pounds or so. And he was running up and down, back and forth, and he'd fall down and jump up. And, and so that you know, was a little bit uh, interesting. And then as we were going through, uh, through the service, uh, people would... People next to me would be laughing and laughing and laughing, and then all of a sudden these people would be crying and sobbing, and I, I was just overwhelmed with all the stuff going on. And they thought that's the power of God. But that's not the power of God. That's the flesh. Verse 18 again, the preaching of the cross is unto us which are saved the power of God. It's dynamite. Because all that other stuff, that people do, and, and we could go on and on and on with many examples, but all that stuff that people do cannot save their soul, cannot give them eternal life, cannot forgive their sins, cannot, if you look back in verse 2, all of that cannot make them the church of God. It can't sanctify them in Christ. It can't make them saints. But the gospel can do all of that and more. And that's why it is the power of God. Uh, turn back with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We looked at this briefly uh, last night, uh, but I, I just want to do so again. Romans chapter 1 and beginning in verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. All the stuff that goes on out there in all the different churches and so forth, uh, that, you know, all, all the stuff that's taught, all the stuff that they do, the ceremonies, the rituals, the emotional excitement, all of that stuff, none of that is the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel of Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. All that other stuff might make you feel good, at least for a while, might make you excited, might make you happy, might you know, do all kinds of stuff, but it won't save your soul. It's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And, and why is there power in the gospel? Verse 17, for therein, in the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The reason there is power to save in the gospel of Christ is that in the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed. And that's what we need. We are unrighteous in the sight of God, and we need righteousness. How can we get righteousness? It's not through all this other stuff. We learn how we can get righteousness through the gospel. And that's why that is the power of God unto salvation. Okay, uh, return to, well, before you go back to 1 Corinthians, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, in the flesh, in a, in a worldly way of thinking, Paul had many things to boast about. He, he, had, he had many attainments that he could impress people with if he so, cho uh, so chose. And, and there's many religious things that Paul could boast about or glory in. But in verse 14, he says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that and only that 
is where you have the power of God unto salvation. Turn again back to 1 Corinthians. Notice in verse 18 that the world is divided into two groups of people. Uh, you may have heard that you can divide everyone in the world into two groups. Those who divide the world into two groups and those who don't. Um, but that's one way to divide. But verse 18, in verse 18, the, the world is divided into two groups. There are, in verse 18, them that perish, and there are us which are saved. The gospel is the power of God unto both of these groups. In the sense, turn to 2 Corinthians for a moment, chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2, and notice verse 16. It says, To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? So when we preach the gospel, there, there, that is the power of God. And to them which believe they're saved. To them that perish, that don't believe, it's that gospel one day, we won't turn to this, but in Romans chapter 2, it's that gospel that one day is going to judge the secrets of men. And so in either case, there's power. Uh, turn back once again to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. One other thing I want to notice in verse or mention in verse 18. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, where the King James says, um, them that perish, the NIV says, those who are perishing. And also where the King James in verse 18 says, um, us which are saved, the NIV says, are being saved. So the, the NIV and some of the other translations feed into a false notion that, that many have that we now in this life ought to be in the process of day by day trying to become better and better people and gradually you know, we become better and hopefully by the time we die we're good, we've, we've become good enough that when we stand before God, he will forgive our sins and we can go to heaven. So the, the idea that salvation is a process that we go through, that you can't sit here this morning and say, I, I'm saved, my sins are forgiven, I have eternal life, but rather it's a process that we go through through, through our lives. And again, the NIV translation feeds into that false idea by, again, it says, those who are perishing and uh, those who are being saved. But in the Bible, um, again, the Bible, in the Bible, as in this verse, divides the world into two groups of people. You have the lost, you have the saved. But nowhere in the Bible does it teach that the lost start out not being lost, and then they go through this process where they're half lost, and then they keep going, and then they're fully lost. Nor does the Bible teach that saved people start out not being saved, and then they gradually become better until they're half saved, and then they keep getting better until they're saved, fully saved. And no, none of you and no one in this world today is like 25% saved or 50% saved or two-thirds saved or, or any such thing. You're either lost or you're saved. So the, it's, a, it's a state, it's a condition. Every person in this world is either lost or they're saved. No one is in the process of being lost. And no one is in the process of being saved. They're one or the other. And so the, the wording here in the King James is correct and important. Um, the NIV and some of the other translations are, are seriously misleading on that issue. Okay, then verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, 
and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So in, uh, in support of what Paul said in verse 18, he quotes a verse. Uh, he says in verse 19, for it is written. And he's quoting from Isaiah 29. So let's just briefly go back there, and then we'll come right back to 1 Corinthians. So Isaiah chapter 29. And we'll just take a, just a minute or so to get a little bit of the context here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 29, and beginning in verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. So it's talking about religious people who draw near to God and they honor with their lips, but their heart is far from him. And then verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people. Before we read on, I, uh, I, I'm, I guess, sometimes humored and sometimes kind of disgusted or saddened um, by the way the word of God is handled. And you know, there, there are many verses like this where it talks about God doing a marvelous work. But what is the marvelous work here? Because you know, usually people are they're praising God for the marvelous work he does and so on and so forth. And uh, it's always about saving people or healing people or you know, this or that. Look at the marvelous work in verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people even a marvelous work and a wonder. And what is that? For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. So that's the marvelous, wonderful work here that God is going to do. And, and, and it's the end of verse 14. Uh, you can go back to 1 Corinthians. It's the end of verse 14 that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 1.19 where he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Uh, and again, that's the marvelous, the wonderful work that God is going to do. We ought not to ever um, be ashamed or feel apologetic about what we believe, nor ought we ever be impressed with the wisdom of the world. Because God's going to destroy it. And that's, we ought not be sad about that. It's a marvelous work. It's a wonderful work that God is going to do in destroying the wisdom of the wise. Turn with me for a moment to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. There are, there are verses in the Bible, um, quite a number of them, that just don't fit real nicely with what many Christians believe. And this is one of them. Matthew chapter 11, and notice verse 25. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. So notice Jesus here is thanking God that he's hiding truth from some people. I think, doesn't God want everyone to know the truth? And you know, aren't we supposed to get the truth out to everyone and hope that they believe? It? But yet, Jesus here is thanking God that he hides the truth from the wise and prudent. And uh, what he, and this again, uh, we won't go back to, but this is again from Isaiah, um, what Matthew's referring to here, or what, Je I'm sorry, what Jesus is referring to. The wise and the prudent in this verse, in the context, are the Pharisees. And they already, um, if you, uh, let's see if I can remember where the verse is. Uh, yeah, chapter 12 in Matthew. Matthew. 
and verse 14, says, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. So the Pharisees by this time had already decided to reject Jesus Christ, and instead they're beginning to plan how to destroy him. And so Jesus uh, thanks God that he's hidden these things from, uh, from those Pharisees. Now, how does, how does he do that? Turn to uh, chapter 13 in Matthew. And I don't want to take a long time on this, but uh, it, it, it's important to understand how, how does God hide the truth from them? It's not that he somehow zaps their mind so they can't understand anything, or he some, somehow takes control of their mind so they're not able to believe. It's not something like that. But how does he hide the truth from them? In Matthew chapter 13, um, at the beginning of the chapter, <clears throat> For the first time, Jesus speaks in parables. And then notice in verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? So again, Jesus hadn't spoken in parables previously. And the disciples are wondering, Now why are you, why are you doing that now? And verse 11, He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you, you disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So when the, the, question, the question is not simply why are you speaking in parables, but the question in verse 10 is why do you speak unto them in parables? And the answer is, in verse 11, to them it is not given. In other words, the, Jesus spoke in parables uh, completely opposite of what many Christians believe and are taught. Um, I was taught all through my early years in, in several churches, I was taught that Jesus spoke in parables to make the truth very simple. So even simple-minded people could understand it. So he, he used very simple illustrations about a, a farmer sowing seed and that everyone can understand that. So it's very simple. But the very opposite of that is what is true, that Jesus spoke on, in parables so that they would not understand. In uh, Continuing in verse 12, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And he's referring there to the disciples. The disciples already had a good deal of truth, and they're going to be given more truth. Because they don't understand the parables either, but Jesus meets privately with them and explains the parables. So they're given more. Um, so again, verse 12, For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, the Pharisees, because they won't receive the truth, they don't understand, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. So even a little bit of understanding they do have is going to be taken away. And again, how is that going to happen? God's not somehow going to reach into their mind and mess with their mind and do something. He's going to speak to them in parables, and they are, they're not going to have any clue what he's talking about. They're just going to get more and more confused. And then verse 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing hear not neither do they understand. And in them, in the Pharisees, is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias. And so he's again going to, like Paul did, refer back to Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Okay, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So that, that is one example of how God destroys the wisdom of the wise. The Pharisees were the great, renowned, highly respected religious leaders in the nation of Israel. 
they were, they, they were all the people in Israel were just amazed with the wisdom of the Pharisees. And God destroys the wisdom of the wise in that case because the truth is hid from them. Christ speaks to them in a way that they don't understand what he's talking about. And the more they try to figure it out, the more confused they get. And, uh, and so he, he destroys the wisdom of the wise. Okay, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again, and verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So where is the wise? And the answer to this question is nowhere. There's, no, there's nowhere where you in the world today or when Paul was alive where you can go out and find a wise man. Wisdom is in the word of God. Wisdom is in Christ. So where is the wise? They're nowhere. Um, you, you all know that Greek, uh, Greece, of course, was, the city of Corinth was in Greece, and Greece, of course, is famous for its philosophers. Um, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, um, and then later around Paul's time, you have the Epicureans and the Stoics. And so they were, they were greatly impressed with their, their wisdom and their philosophy. And Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, where is the wise? And they're nowhere because God has destroyed their wisdom. Um, and just quickly in verse 20, where is the scribe? Um, the scribe has to do with religion. Israel had their scribes. Uh, and then where is the disputer of this world? And I, I believe that has to do, um, one of the things I believe that has to do with, and I, um, time is about out, so I'm not going to take a long time in this, but is science, scientists. So in verse 20, you have the wise, the scribe, the disputer of this world. You have philosophy, religion, and science. If you look to philosophy, religion, and science, you will never, ever, ever find the power of God unto salvation. You will never know God through philosophy, religion, or science, but only through the word of God, only through the preaching of the cross will you find that wisdom and that power. Father, we thank you for this time to uh, continue our studies in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, I, I hope this will be uh, uh, very clear to each of us that uh, we ought not be impressed with the wisdom of this world in, in whatever form it is, but rather we should rejoice each and every day in the power of God uh, that there is in the preaching of the cross, the power unto salvation. And we thank you for this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.